your thoughts on entanglements? You're for them or against them? I'm for two people stating needs and negotiating how to meet them. That is how you get into a fulfilling and stay in a fulfilling relationship. If you become honest enough and authentic enough to share your needs with your partner, to hear your partner's needs, and then the two of you get creative about how you're going to meet those needs. And if an entanglement is how you're going to meet that need, more power to you because you want to be fulfilled and happy. And when people leave their relationships, it's because their needs aren't being met. For sure. No one leaves a relationship where their needs are being met. Bottom line. Okay. All right. You're a relationship expert. You, this is your thing. And tell people a little bit about your background. Cause you're, you're right. You're from so, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is the I'm home of the death, death of George Floyd and also that's Prince. Right. I was actually, and that's right. I was at the Memorial yesterday, a very emotional, very moving. There's nowhere you can go in this city where you're not feeling George Floyd. Um, so how did I get to relationships? Well, I think, I, or to be a relationship expert, I think it's because I failed so much. Like, I'm like the person, I'm the jailhouse lawyer, right? I've done so much work on my own case, now I can help you with yours. Um, and it's not that I have it all figured out. So I'm not coming from the place of like, oh, I've had a 40-year marriage. When I talk to somebody who's been married for 30 years, I'm like, you don't know me. <laughs> that is not my life. Like, I came out of foster care and I come into relationships with a whole lot of baggage that I've had to sort out in order to begin to relate from a place of secure attachment. And I just didn't have that. So I had to learn the science of relationships. Instead, I think what most people are doing is they're just out there ad hoc, taking like whatever their best friend says, plus whatever their mom says, plus whatever the conventional wisdom is. And that's not going to lead you to happiness or fulfillment in any kind of consistent way. Maybe you might luck into it, but there is actually a lot of hard science on what constitutes and what creates trust and healthy, fulfilling relationships. And I'm kind of about that. And I'm about that because I had to learn it in order to even begin to get a happy, healthy relationship. And I will say I am single. But I don't stay in relationships that don't work anymore, you know. So I think if you're leveling up, a lot of times other partners do not want to level up with you. So there's no shame in a breakup. It's, it's more about you just want what's in the highest good, you know. So that's a little bit about me. So, so how do you – what's the science behind trust? Because I think that's – for me, that's everything, mm-hmm. right? Trust. Thank if you. I can't it, trust you – I do not even want you around me. Yes. And there are many forms of trust. It's not just are you, I mean, because there are many forms of betrayal. Like betrayal, for instance, on family or fiance, you see many forms of betrayal. Betrayal, one form is where you put your mom first instead of your partner. That's a form of betrayal. You have to be in, that partner has to be primary, So anytime you're not making the partner primary, you're essentially um, undermining trust in your relationship. So there are many things that build the trust, okay? One of them is turning toward your partner. If your partner makes what's called a bid, so a bid is, it can be like they're reading the paper and they go, hmm, that's a bid. (laughs) So if you go, oh, what is it, honey? Or you could just ignore it. Now, a bid could be a lot bigger than that. It could be like, can we talk about what happened last night? And you go, you know, I don't really want to talk about it. The more bids you turn down with your partner, the less trust you're going to have in your relationship. There's just two things that go into the trust equation. Many different factors go into it. Another factor would be um, when you attune to your partner. So attunement is when you sort of mind map your partner, because we all have mind maps very quickly of the people we're in relationships with, not just our partners, but our kids, our bosses, our moms, like whoever. You kind of know how they're going to react to something. And when you are correctly attuned to your partner and you can sort of predict what they're, what's going to bother them, what's not going to, and I don't mean in a codependent way, I mean in a way that creates um 
a calm nervous system for your partner. So the more you work toward keeping your partner and your partner works toward keeping you in like actual like a state of body that's not hypervigilant and not and is not all activated, the more trust you're going to build. These are just a few things that go into it. Hmm. I got yeah. So real quick, so the bids would those yeah. be considered bids. passive aggressive behavior? Is that what? Is that not necessarily? Thing? No. See, oh. here's the thing you've got. You are gonna. Here's the radical change, right? So there's this term actually called radical consideration, where you sort of decide that everything my partner has going on is important to me. Here's the book I want to write, guys. Parenting and partnering are one letter off. Everything it takes to have a secure attachment to your partner are all the same things that a secure attachment with a parent and a child look like. It's the same deal. So if you go around ignoring your child or your your child gives you signals like, I'm in distress or I'm upset or your child acts out, for example, and what you see is like, a bad or annoying child instead of a child who's expressing needs the only way they know how, you got to bring that same consciousness into your partnering and go, it is my job to care for this person as their primary attachment figure. So what do you get for that? And I'm glad we're having this uh, such a deep conversation of this because, you know, usually people are like the level of conversation about relationships is like, you go girl. (laughs) That's not going to do it. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So what you get when you have attunement in these things and you're paying attention to bids and you're looking at things that your partner says and does as the expression of needs instead of things that are annoying you or ways that they're trying to condescend or put you down or bother you or annoy you or whatever, some me-centered idea of what my partner is expressing. What you get is what's called secure functioning. And when you have secure functioning, here's what happens you know your relationship is there and you don't have to pay attention to it in the same way. You get to go explore the world. So when people have a secure base that they're operating from, they can go, they can go build things in the world, be of service, create things, do things that you can't do when you're either avoidantly attached to a partner or anxiously attached to a partner. Both of those preclude taking from a partnership what is really there um, when you're doing, when you have secure functioning and a secure base. Because when you have that, you can see these couples too. They're, they're, they're not like, um, their, their relationship is a source for them. It's not a drain. And that's the difference. And this is what you want is to create relationships that are a source instead of a drain where you can get your needs met, but you can also go engage with the world. Family or fiancé? Yeah, uh, no, we Tracy don't get McMillan. into it that hard. In no, I know, because it's own, it's television. And this is the problem, you know, this right. is why I love doing this show, because, you know, we have enough frivolity and shallow uh, engagements, you know. It's time for and us to get deep, deep with ourselves and others. Show. Okay, we go about, deep. Right. We just don't go into this much theory. I know this is for you, Karen. <laughs> all right, I, pre- I appreciate you. Tra- so I'm going to ask you, why are you single? If you know all of this stuff. Good question. Good question. Okay. So I've been married and divorced three times. So after my once each in the eighties, nineties and zero zeros. Now my last marriage, I was 40 years old. I finally found my dad. Okay. I'm like, daddy. I didn't know that though. I just thought I was in love and needed to get married right away okay (laughs) but my dad was like a pimp and a drug dealer who was in prison most of my life so when i feel that intense level of attraction and i haven't unpacked my dad's stuff yet you know you're going to open that up and it's going to be like and that's what happened so my third husband started acting a lot like my dad would which I remember in my second marriage, which was to my kid's father, it was very stable, but, you know, I accidentally got pregnant and we probably shouldn't have gotten married, even though we're great co-parents. I remember early in that marriage, I said to my dad, my dad goes, how's your new marriage going? I go, it's going fine. 
I'm like, it's fine, but, and he's like, you're wondering when the dating starts? <laughs> no, that just gives you a picture of my dad's mentality. Well, in my third marriage, I'm like, I finally found him, you guys, the one. But then after nine months of marriage, he started dating. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's what's called a reenactment, okay? And there's, and that's what's called repetition compulsion. We are compelled to repeat things that happened in childhood that we haven't resolved yet. Okay. And we can either keep doing it or get busy in the resolution once we see what's happening. And that's what I did. So I haven't been married in 15 years. I've had three relationships, though. But I'm going to say there's two kinds of relationships. There's companionship and there's partnership. Now, because I was building a career, I was a single mom, I had a kid at home, I wasn't really into driving your carpool, cooking your dinner, doing your laundry, living in your house, partnering in that way. I wasn't into it for a lot of years because I had to work out all that stuff that I just talked about with my marriages, and I clearly had a lot of work to do. So that was number one. And then number two, I wasn't really looking for that kind of partnership. I really just was like, Let's be together Thursday through Sunday when our kids are at their other parents and it'll be stable. But that's, that was what I was looking for. I almost was like, you would be if you were 26, you're like, I'm not ready to get married right now, but I don't need to be alone either. But I know what place this is in my life. Okay. So after almost six years of a long-term companionship, it really came to the point where it's like, okay, this relationship, I'm ready for partnership. And this isn't where I want to partner. So that's where I am now. <laughs> I love it. So how does one find, we had a conversation last Wellness Wednesday because there, uh, a woman called up, we were talking about interracial stuff, which you mm -hmm. can bring in on as well, of course. Uh, Tracy McMillan is here, host of Family or Fiance on OWN. And... I, it, it broke my heart because she was basically, you know, not angry, but sad that so many men, black men are with white women. And she said, there's very mm. not enough for us black women. And she, right. you know, and she's single. And I was like, you know, what do you do if you're single and you mm. don't want to be single? You're you've made choices. I've made yeah. choices. Lamont has made True. choices. And these right. are choices that not only are we, you know, conscious about, but, you know, have been very willful about. But if you're somebody that wants to be not in an entanglement, because that's complicated, right. but in a partnership yep. Yep. and you can't find somebody to partner with, right. what, what advice do you have, Tracy? Well, so I'm going to say, I, I think you have to move into a spiritual space on this because you can't be thinking about odds, right? Like just like my life, like I am, was a foster child. I have nine out of 10 adverse childhood experiences. If I'm doing the odds, I'm already dead, right? I'm already dead. I already gave up my children. I already got a needle hanging out of my arm. Like, forget odds, okay? I'm not interested in it. What I'm interested in is what you're here for and what your intention is. And so I think you have to move into a spiritual space because I do believe that if you are really here for something, it will come into your life. Now, Maybe not. Maybe not. It might not look like you think, but it, I think it comes into your life. So far, I see that. Can't be sure. But so I think when you're in the mindset of like, there's not enough or the white women have them or any of those limitations, it's just like it collapses something inside and it collapses something in the field of what's possible and I think that there's a whole spiritual practice around maintaining that expansion, even when you can't see it. Mm. So that would be, I would say, do a lot of work around that and see what becomes possible in your world. Where did you go to expand your possibilities, Tracy McMillan, because you have it? Where did you? Well, I'd say I've done every single possible thing. Literally every single possible thing. And I'm always looking for new things. I'm like, bring me the new thing. So first of all, just a relationship is going to offer you a lot of opportunity to unpack some stuff. If you look at it as that, or you could look at it as like, I don't like this, or, you know, this isn't, you know, feel good right now. I'm like, okay, fine. But if you look at it as 
that person is showing you where you have work to do, and then you go mm. take that as your scavenger hunt. Like, I'm going to go find a paper clip, and then I'm going to go find a whatever, bobby pin, you know. And you can get a lot of work done. So that's what I've done. I've been to so much therapy, 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 therapy. It works. You don't just do one therapy for your whole time, though. You you avail yourself. There's different methodologies. They all work in different ways. I would start with talk therapy and then also go to some body-centered therapy. Right now, I'm very much into kundalini yoga breath work, for example. This is like some ancient 4,000-year-old technology around breath that really does connect you and unpack trauma. Um, I've done a lot of EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization, a, a technique, EMDR, look it up. Brain spotting, which is like another more um, more advanced version of EMDR. Um, I've read tons of stuff. I'm totally self-taught on attachment theory. I would also say I do a lot of exercise. I eat well. I take care of my, my body temple. Um, I've definitely done a lot of prayer and meditation, group therapy. Um, you name it. I'm a Virgo, so I'm like... Let's uh, do it, you know? And you know what, <laughs> everything that you're saying, you know why it's so powerful is because you're working on yourself. You're not looking for someone this. to fix That's you. Right. You're not seeking no. somebody to help you. You are picking up your mat and walking with it every day and making right. every day a journey to be better. And if everyone did that, then there's no, the you're, you're never a victim. It's a different world. That's right. Oh, I'm never a victim. No. Mm -mm. I have to look at how did I open the door to this? Is it, I maybe didn't choose it consciously, but I opened the door somewhere along the line. And when I can see where that happened, I can go, okay, I'm, I'm gentle with myself. I'm not a punishing mom to me. I'm, I'm like, okay, that's all right. When you know better, you do better. And that's okay, you know. And it's been a lot of work to develop that kind of voice inside that is a loving, gentle voice. Um, but that's where it all starts is that relationship with myself and how do I speak to me. And that just translates to the world because really we're only ever having one relationship, the one we're having with right. ourselves. And right. then we just project that out into the world and start having it with everyone else, you know, even yeah. though we think it's them. We've seen uh, recently a lot of uh, high-profile relationships come to an end after many, many years. And we jokingly mm -hmm. talk about, you know, we blame it on being quarantined with your significant other and being locked down because we know that adds a, a, a level of stress. Now, in a, no normal relationship, in a normal relationship, you should have outlets. Now, if those outlets mm -hmm. are taken away, like what do you suggest people do in these confined spaces for these long periods of time? Yeah, I think that... I think you cannot even forget estimate or under uh, overestimate or under you can't even estimate what the quarantine has meant to people. I heard an expert on grief talk about how even though we're just going about our daily lives, the fact is is a hundred and forty thousand people have died around us, and on a spiritual level, there's just one where there's no separation. So we're perceiving that. We know this thing is out there, even if we don't think about it consciously. So the level of wear and tear, I think, during this time, can't you just can't even estimate what it really is doing to us, and it's affecting everyone different. Like one, one of my images for what COVID is, and I think it can be a, it can be a blessing in a weird way, like one of my images for COVID is it's like, remember when you were little and you would go to the dentist and they would have you brush your teeth and then you would chew on the tablet and it would show you everywhere you missed. I feel oh. like that's what COVID's doing. It's just like it comes in and it's just showing everywhere that you haven't seen something, there it is. Whether it's in your marriage, your work life. Like I really saw in quarantine that I had substituted a lot of like, social engagement, social interactions, work interactions for the kind of deeper connection that you have in a partnership. And it just made it really clear to me that, oh, I didn't really see this. Like, 
I'm really alone out here. And so I've made some changes. So one of the things I, my house is in LA, but I've relocated to Zoom. So I was like, I'm going to go back to Minneapolis. I'm going to start getting into some connections here. And if this is going to offer me an opportunity, offer me an opportunity to like look into some things, you know, and maybe revisit. I always come to Minneapolis and I'm like, why can't I be here? It feels good to be here. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to be here. And I'm actually just allowing that. I don't know what's, there's so much uncertainty rather than try to lock in some certainty, which is not one of the options right now, just lean in to the uncertainty and go, all right, I'm not even going to live in my house. I'm just going to go where the day takes me. And I think it's been an interesting experiment so far. It's been about two and a half weeks. And I don't really know where it's going to end. I really don't. And I'm okay with that. I'm living with that, you know. Now, when some people get see where they have work to do, they blame the other person and go, never mind, right? It's like a lot of times the reason people are able to stay together is because they they have enough, they have figured out a way to keep the beach ball underwater, you know, to, to like keep life busy enough that the, the underlying issues in the relationship never surface. Well, COVID said, here they come, here come your issues. So if you're not willing to really do the work, which is the self work in order to restore the connection with the partner, you know, then a lot of people are going to break up. You know, and not everybody's supposed to stay together. Like, I don't think everybody's supposed to stay together because if the underlying agreements, because people have all sorts of agreements, if the agreements in a relationship are not agreements that are mm, allow people to flourish, then people should <laughs> deal with that, you know? And why did they make an agreement like that? And what's going on inside of them and then hopefully make the changes that allow them to be in a place where they're a more thriving human being. And why is that so important? Because you can't be of service out there or do anything for anybody else if you're just barely trying to keep yourself together. And this Mm. is the whole point of secure attachment and good relationship is that it allows you to go do other stuff, you know, instead of just be like in some little thing, fighting or like a a little rat on a wheel that's no kind of life that's not why we're here you know should everybody be in a relationship and do you know you talked about companionship versus mm -hmm. partnership Mm -hmm. does everybody need to be in a partnership everybody needs primary attachment everybody that is a feature of being a primate so you're gonna do it somewhere you see a lot of people do it with pets some people do it with their kids. Don't do it with your kids. Your kids <laughs> need to go find primary attachment somewhere for themselves, you know, because, right. like, they didn't come here for you. <laughs> mm. you know what Hello. I mean? they got you better to say do. that. Yes. Right? So it's like, and people think they own their kids or their kids are a source for them. No, that's not it. We're guardians, we're custodians, we take special care of something, but the whole point is to help this person. This is what I'm saying. The connection between the relating and the parenting is very strong because your kids, if you've been sort of receiving from your kids, which means you're the child, by the way, you know, I remember having a a recent discussion with my dad. He was like, I want to have more of a relationship like I see these other people, fathers and daughters having. And I'm like, we have the one we have, okay? And now you just got to look at how you co-created that. And now I'm not even mad at you. I love you. I think you're awesome. But you were in prison for 37 years. So we're doing pretty good, actually, the <laughs> fact that we get along and we talk on the phone. Like, I don't think we can look at the Hallmark thing and go, I wish we had that. Just like I don't look at you and say, why didn't you put a down payment on the house? I thought somebody else's dad did that for them. Like, Let's get realistic. You know what I'm saying? So you don't want to, and basically I was saying to my dad, like, oh, you don't get what parenting is. It's when it's a one, it's kind of a one way street. You do it for fun and for free, you know, and then that's your service. And then your child does that for their child and like, whatever, that's how it works. And then you got to go get your needs met by somebody who's a, you can have mutuality with because mutuality is a key part of, 
a healthy, flourishing relationship. It can't be where there's these giant power inequities. So that's why you can't get your primary attachment from your children because your children don't aren't equal to you in that way. They don't have the same amount of life experience. So, so anyway, see, I could go off. But No, 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 because we, you just trigger something. Because when I see a, a 60 or 50-year-old man with a 20-year-old woman or vice versa, I, right. I, I say, how can that possibly be an equal relationship? Well, if he, that's his developmental stage, if he is oh. in the 20 something year old developmental stage, that's going to be fine. Okay. All right. And usually go. I'm going to say a 50 year old man who's in a, a mature developmental stage, isn't going to want a 20 something year old woman. That's not going to be. So that's very telling. There's no that's very equality. Telling. Oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. 